Hi, I'm Mark Bodman. In today's episode, we're going to talk a little bit about what CSDM is in a nutshell. And But uh, before I get started into CSDM, I did want to start with a little bit of background and what our strategic context for how we think about CSDM within the ServiceNow platform. So the first thing I want to do is really introduce you to a few concepts here. Uh, there's a lot on this slide here, but the first thing I really wanted to highlight is that we are looking at the full lifecycle management on our platform of your digital products and services. And the idea here is that when you create within your organization, we want to manage the full lifecycle. What basically are you investing in from a planning point of view? What, what are your priorities for uh, the teams that will develop or buy or, or implement new products and services for your internal or customer use? Um, and then how that gets coded, tested, or and then released into production, whether it's on-premise or in the cloud. Um, and then when you deploy those applications and services, uh, how are they operating? And then how are they being used by various cu uh, customers or internal employees? So internal employees are more or less what ITSM is all about. You're servicing consumption of your services uh, from an internal point of view. And then we, have a, we sell a product called CSM that deals with your customers and how they use the specific products and services that depend on technology. Underneath all of this, we you might have heard this terminology called Service Graph. And the way I like to explain this is that Service Graph is really the CMDB in its traditional sense, which is uh, used only for operational purposes and, and expanding that to the entire life cycle. Remember, this is what we're looking at, is, is looking at the whole life cycle for your digital products and services. But we want to expand that concept into things that aren't typically in a operational CMDB. These are going to be conceptual business elements, the things that, that are getting coded, um, the release plan. So being able to understand you know, the stories and epics or even project plan that was associated to what was deployed and what's being used by your customers or internal employees. And so this is really the, the strategic context of what we're solving for within the platform and various products that we sell solve different things along this value chain. Now, the thing we don't have necessarily is all of the products and we do integrate with various products. If you're using Git or Jira or a cloud resource, you might want to integrate those along the way, but they're still part of the equation when it becomes managed uh, from an operational point of view and consumed for your, by your customers and internal employees. So CMDB and beyond is what Service Graph is all about. And the CSDM model is really the guidance that includes everything from a Service Graph point of view, not just your CMDB from a traditional infrastructure management point of view. Uh, we are covering a lot more of the life cycle, things that are happening within the planning cycle and like things like business capabilities and business apps, but also starting to connect into DevOps activities, teams and sprints that are uh, associated with the deliverables that teams are working on, and all the way through, of course, traditional operations and service management. So this is uh, our, our take on how we move beyond just a CMDB, and we needed a terminology to talk about the model as it exists beyond just the traditional CMDB. So think, think of Service Graph as CMDB plus or beyond, okay? So that's kind of what that's all about. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because when we get into the model, there are elements of this model that are outside of traditional operations. And there's some that are in development and used for planning purposes. And then, of course, parts of this model that are in service management. These are the three lobes that we had introduced in the previous diagram. And those relate to the products that we sell in each of those areas and also areas on the model, the domains of CSDM align with that. The design domain, which is really where your planning activities and development activities happen. Your managed uh, technical services, which is all about managing the piece parts or what's running in the data center, either on-prem or in the cloud or a combination. And then we've got the consumption, which is the service management parts or the customer service management parts, which uh, deals with your end customers and their satisfaction with your delivery. So those are all the key components of the different parts of CSDM. And it all sits on what we call the foundations domain. And the foundations domain deals with the referenced information that's used across all of these other domains. So for example, uh, location hierarchy. The location hierarchy could be where are your employees that are consuming? Where are your customers that are consuming your services? Or where are the 
assets that are deployed in data centers or in the cloud. Uh, there are certain things that you need to account for, such as privacy, and, and there's also data sovereignty rules in, in, in Europe. That means the users are one place, their data needs to be in the same place. And then we have, of course, locations of the developers that might be developing these solutions or implementing or supporting them. So you really want to do things like match up your support group's location uh, with where your customers or employees are, ideally. Those are all things you need to keep in mind. And this is the Common Service Data Model 3.0. And I'm just going to go through some of the main elements of the model and kind of talk about how we typically implement this model. What we typically see is that most organizations know the applications that they have. Now, how they're managing it, there's different levels of, I would say, governance established. If you're using our own APM product, that would actually help to manage what applications do you even have and what they're and how you're managing them. What's the description of these apps and how do those provide value to the business? So you we typically see this as being a very good starting point for most organizations. Underneath the business application are the application services. And this is the center of the model, and it's important to take this into account because what we find is most organizations don't know what that means. And the best way to describe it, I come from a development background, is that when you decide to build an application, you hire your development team, and your development team starts deploying your app or writing it right within the development environment. And so the uh, each environment uh, is, is accounted for as an app service. Think about that is the configured stack, the configured application instance, or system that represents the application and all its other resources, the compute, all the different pieces of code, the operating system, the network devices. And so development is accounted for within one of the environments of the application service. You have the testing or QA environments, and you also have each production environment accounted for in this application service. And those application services are managed mostly here by our product called Service Mapping. And Service Mapping provides the connectivity and understanding of how those particular deployments work with all the underlying infrastructure. And that's where we get into the, your classic CIs, your classic uh, physical CIs, physical part of the model is down at the very bottom. And so your conceptual part of the model is up at the top. Conceptually, you have one record to represent the app. You have many records over here. Uh, that's your logical part of the model in the app service that represent each deployment of that application and uh, development included. And then, of course, the physical part of the model down here. And when I say physical, it's not just within your data center, but it, all these physical entities could be in the cloud. So obviously, if those were in the cloud, the application service really is just your logical model and you're just pointing to a cloud service from that point of view. So this is what we call our crawl stage. When you're getting into CSDM and you're not sure where to start, this is a good place to start as you establish this conceptual, logical, and physical tiers. Now likewise, if you do have an established, well managed set of services, you can just do this uh, path through either technical service or business service. But we do find as a lot of organizations do not have their dynamic CI group set up yet, and they do not have offerings. So uh, there's a bit of a danger, a little bit of a, uh, I would say, a warning sign when you're trying to use start from a service point of view, because if you don't have the offerings established, okay, this is going to be an area where you, you want to establish. You don't want to skip over this. Why is because this is where your SLA, OLA, and commitments are all stored on the offering level. And at a, at a minimum, what I would suggest if you're establishing that technical and business service point of view first, is that you at least create a one for one. You create that technical service offering that matches each technical service and likewise for business service. And you notice the symmetry between this side on the left and the side on the right. We'll get into the next stage where when you're establishing technical services or business services, you have to think about the, the consumer. The, the nature of the deliverable is part of it. They're all technology at the end of the day, but the nature of the deliverable and um, also the consumer is what drives what kind of service it is. And the best way to describe it for most technology services, you don't have a person subscriber, okay? You don't have a person that is going to be impacted by an outage at this level. And there are kind of three tiers of the technology services. The bottom one I'm not going to get into because that's pure labor. The first one's very accommodating in terms of the consumer is not really known is because when you're ordering piece parts, let's say you're building a car, you're, you're ordering nuts, bolts, uh, pieces of steel, brakes, tires, the supplier doesn't know or care how you're going to use them as long as you're using them within the prescribed way of using those piece parts. 
And then there's warranty that's based on all of those products being supplied as basically resources or components used in a bigger system. So this is how you have to look at that technology service at the very bottom. These are components used in a larger configured system. And we have this dynamic CI group to keep track of those elements as they're entered into the environment or taken out of the environment. And so this is driven by a query that you can define based on the CI class, the type of CI it is, the vendor, and that's where you match it up with the offering, which is where, again, your SLA, OLA, and support groups are all established. So now your infrastructure owner, when they provide those infrastructure ordering capabilities in the catalog, uh, as those catalog items are fulfilled and added to the environment, your, your query picks them up and now they're part of that technical service offering. And so now they can manage that to the SLA that they prescribed and they originally offered you. So this is an important part of the technology service difference. There is no particular subscriber. Yes, I might have been the person that ordered those technology services and stood them up for some reason, but those are usually folks that are on a project which they, they leave the project afterwards and they're no longer sticking around. The context of use is really established at the app service. And so for the uh, next tier of application services is applications and platforms, again, with the technology consumer in mind. And what we have here are the uh, applications such as LDAP. If uh, I went to work for your organization as a developer, I would want to first request, uh, let's say a server infrastructure so I can do my development and maybe some you know, more expensive servers for my production environment so I can deploy it into production as I app is finished. The next tier is really all about being able to leverage uh, applications that don't provide a direct business value. Things like LDAP. LDAP is a system that provides authentication and authorization for your end customers. So whoever they are, you know, internal employees. So when you start building an application, you want to leverage LDAP as a way of creating a single sign-on experience for customers or for your employees. And that comes from a, a, a need for your application developers to now request access to that LDAP, to know how to use it. And then that might entail an approval process. It could actually entail issuing a credential to be able to log in and use LDAP appropriately. It also can entail issuing a certificate in which to sign your code to be basically authorized to use the LDAP in a single sign way. So those are the technology consumers for, for the applications used on backend IT. When you think about platforms, this is another type of technology consumer. In ServiceNow, we are a platform ourselves. And though uh, as a platform, you need to have some technical training and there needs to be some governance to use our platform and develop new applications on our platform. So this is a technology deliverable as well. And as a developer, you can leverage our platform uh, through a request catalog to grant access and maybe provide knowledge about how to use the platform and how to deploy your apps once you're done. All of that can be self-service through a request catalog. And then those applications that are deployed would basically live on the platform. And so we have a dynamic and we'll get into that in a separate video. So there's a dynamic here where you can have application services that depend on, on the platform application services. So this one is a platform app, and this one down here is a platform host. There's an example, I'll provide a link in the video here so that you can go look at that example for platforms. I think that's an important one. I'll also provide an example video for the LDAP example. This is a standalone technical service, and is it a common pattern for us to implement uh, CSDM on as well? The next part of this CSDM model is all about the business service offering. And you'll see that the structure is the same. We put the offering in the catalog and with the SLA OLA, and we provide access to it through a catalog. Now the request catalog can be request to the initial quest, but it also can be to go back and manage and maintain or even reallocate your resources back into the pool because you don't need them anymore. And this is the same thing we want to provide an experience for your business consumers. The big thing that I would actually add here though is that we need to maintain who are those consumers and so uh, when you're looking at service management and you're looking at service portfolio management specifically you're looking at managing those subscribers and the subscribers come in multiple flavors and the the, the finest granularity of subscribers you know the exact user you know the person that is using that particular service. If they're a group of, ser of people, it might be the group that's uh, got access. And if there's a location that subscribes to a service, everybody in a location might have access to a particular deployment 
application service, then they would uh, be the subscriber. And then at the highest level is you could be a whole business unit. So let's say the HR department has access to HR services. And when they come in, you can have a catalog experience that shows them, hey, you're in HR, you get these services, but other people don't. So this is an important thing on being able to track those subscribers, uh, the entitlements to be able to provide in a catalog that's tailored to their role and their needs as a employee. The next part of this is really once you establish all of those services um, and you've got the subscribers, you need to manage the portfolio of services. So you're looking at grouping those for reporting purposes. Often the business relationship manager gets involved as escalations or planning goes on. And we have this other connection here. We start introducing something called a business capability. And the business capability, the way I like to think about it, is what the business does. And it's not how it's done, but it's what the business does. How it's done is some, somewhat facilitated by the investments in applications, but also in what applications are used. So for example, you may set up an application service uh, platform like SharePoint, and the SharePoint service uh, will be used by creating uh, sites for various uh, users, for various groups and secure organizations that want to uh, leverage this SharePoint for collaboration services. And when you do that, of course, now this is providing a value on top of the SharePoint services. So the use is what we want to be able to track here with this feedback loop to capability. So if SharePoint goes down this application, we understand that, that the certain business service has an impact to certain capabilities, such as HR sales, maybe depending on SharePoint or Zoom or some shared service like that. But uh, the, the use of the, of the service is really this direction. And the investment, I like to think about it, is down in this direction. The last thing I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about is that you uh, have things like information object in here. An information object is a little bit higher level of maturity. Is It's knowing what kind of data is there, how it's used, and being able to leverage things like GRC to audit applications that are dealing with, let's say, uh, credit card data. Credit card data is one of the types of information that the application could be designed to use, and therefore it's subject to a PCI audit. Or in healthcare, healthcare records uh, could be sub subject to a HIPAA audit. So these are different uh, ways of using information object, and GRC is another is a another product that is used in that context. And the other thing I wanted to kind of start mentioning is how this information is also used from a foundation point of view. Product models is a key thing that we reference for every CI. Every CI could have a product model associated with it. But in reality, most organizations don't have that. If you have hardware asset management and software asset management, you can then um, relate those and use those in asset management uh, use cases. SAM or HAM is what we call them here. And with that relationship, we get the um, entitlements from a contractual point of view for those uh, resources, whether it's licenses or hardware. We also deal with things like end of life or end of support dates. So if those end of life dates are coming up, uh, then you can see how many times we've deployed that particular piece of technology down here and we can start planning getting rid of it or upgrading it as required. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, this has been just a brief overview of what CSDM. We have training uh, available and now learning. We also have a community site with lots of uh, people participating to ask questions and provide the answers that you might be looking for. So please join us in adopting and looking at CSDM further and hope to see you soon.